Good morning and welcome to Hot Seat. I'm Scott Mitchell. My guest is Senator Adam Pugh from Edmond, the chair of the Senate Education Committee. And we're talking education reform as it works its way through the Capitol. Senator Pugh, good to have you. Good morning, Scott. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And so let's start with the education package. The education package went through the House. The speaker very famously said, urging, he said, I think the Senate should pass this thing without any amendments to get it back through the house but you folks did put amendments in there under your leadership there you've made some amendments so a lot of people are starting to ask two big questions to me number one is will the senate and the house be able to work out their differences before the end of may for uh, to to put these education reforms these much needed education reforms into play for uh, the teachers the students in the state of oklahoma you know, I certainly hope so. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident, you know, just based on, you know, the conversations I've had with a, a bunch of colleagues, not only in the Senate, but also in the House. You know, I, like every legislator, I've got a lot of friends over there and, and personal relationships of, you know, men and women I really respect. And, and I, I have um, worked with them for, this is my seventh year in this building. So, you know, I certainly hope that at the end of a session that we'll be able to say, you know, united that we have made the largest investment in kids and in public education in the history of the state of Oklahoma. All right. So tell us what the differences are between the House and the Senate. As you know it right now, it's obviously your the amendments that go back to the House and obviously they'll reject and then you're going to go to conference. So let's start with the differences in the bills. In House Bill 2775, which is you know, the public education funding bill, the, the really the key differences, Scott, are first off, our teacher pay raise it looks looks a little bit different. Um, it is a larger teacher pay raise. You know, the house the house plan was a twenty five hundred dollar teacher pay raise across the board for those who are uh, directly in the classroom. Our teacher pay raise on average was $5,300, though it was tiered uh, at different intervals across the uh, salary tables. Uh, in addition to that, our pay raise included you know, speech language pathologists and media specialists, reading specialists, counselors. So all really all what I would call you know, certified personnel. Um, so, so that certainly was a significant difference in the, in the two plans. Um, additionally, our plan runs the money through the funding formula, uh, which I believe to be the correct mechanism for us to fund public schools based on a weighted, what's called a weighted average daily membership. And, and then we also did make some additional tweaks to the state aid funding formula to highlight you know, priority areas where we felt we wanted to be able to allocate those additional dollars. Some of those areas would be in things like the transportation factor. So we know over the last few years that transportation costs have gone up for schools. So uh, my understanding is that the transportation factor hasn't changed since 1983. So the, our bill changes that factor from 1.39 to two, allowing for more dollars to flow to schools based on how many kids there, uh, what's called your average daily haul, as well as how many miles uh, that our transportation, primarily buses, obviously, are uh, driving kids to and from schools back into their communities. Uh, additionally, we added some weights to the economically disadvantaged uh, factor, as well as special education and some special needs and special abilities weights. And then finally, um, there was a, a last kind of unique component to the Senate plan where we added my colleague, uh, David Bullard, have been working for quite a while on what what is called a qualitative pay. So he has added a qualitative pay component to our plan. We are we are funding that for up to five thousand dollar dollar stipends for uh, the top ten percent designated uh, teachers and support staff across all school districts in the state. One of the aspects of this sort of debate and this sort of discussion on public policy is it's so in the weeds. And I remember I did a video a few years ago about state funding formula 
it's just, it is mind boggling to try to figure this out. So for folks who are sitting at home and they're watching the Senate and the house talk back and forth about what needs to be done, how are parents, let's just take them parents, grandparents that are looking at this debate or this discussion about public policy, how are they going to be able to decide which version is best for them? And number two, do you think at this particular point that there's enough that there's enough momentum moving forward to try to get this with the conference and get something done and signed on education reform by the end of May. And let me answer your second question first. I, again, I certainly hope so. Um, you know, let's just think of this now from the start of session to now we're, you know, the end of March. I mean, both chambers have essentially agreed to make a significant, in fact, so significant, it would be the largest increase in public education funding in, in, in the history of the state of Oklahoma. That's a big deal. And, and I think both chambers, you know, have committed and prioritized that type of historic funding investment. So I'm optimistic now that we have a wonderful starting place for both the House and the Senate to be collaborating and building, you know, consensus first amongst both our caucuses, obviously, and then to have leadership come together and, and work through the differences in the bill and negotiate through the normal budgeting process as we move towards the end of session to be able to, you know, have that come to realization through, through the budget that we're going to pass at the end of session sometime in May. And with respect to, you know, how, how would parents be able to know the difference? You know, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, the, the schools and which schools are really going to benefit the most. And I think it's really important to just highlight that it really has, to, the focus has to be on the kids. And I think that's, you know, has been my perspective and really what I've been, you know, trying to keep at the center of all discussions is regardless of, you know, the school name and the school district, we have to look at where where are the kids and ensure that when we start talking about you know funding students we have to make sure that where the most students are we have to make sure they have the right resources and when you keep that focus on students it doesn't matter what quadrant of the state they come from or what zip code they live in or what school district that they attend you ensure that as best as possible we direct the maximum amount of money into each classroom and to those students and to the teachers that are spending the time inside those classrooms educating those kids. So at the end of the day, um, whether it be, you know, the House some idea, has some ideas how to do that and the Senate some, has some ideas how to do that, we just want to ensure that we're maximizing the dollars to get into the classroom to the kids where they are, regardless of where they live or what school they attend or what zip code they're coming from. And I think if that's the perspective, I think there's a lot of room for us to come to an agreement and figure out, you know, how to do this collectively, where we're, we're representing the interest of each of our caucus, and we're certainly different bodies, the House and the Senate. But I think there's a lot more that we're agreeing on than um, is really being discussed, you know, publicly right now. Also, most of the discussions we've been having in the media have been, been about the House caucus and the Republican caucus. But until a couple of decades ago, Democrats ran things in the state of Oklahoma. And, the, and while that their representation in the legislature is much smaller than it used to be, a leader Floyd and leader Munson still have, have weighed in on this. Are you taking into account the, the contributions and the suggestions that Democrats have made? There are still a lot of Democrats left in Oklahoma who really are interested in this debate not just between the two Republican sides in the legislature. Certainly, Scott. I mean, I represent almost 85,000 people, and that's the same for every senator. And so certainly I want to make sure that they have equal representation when we're having these discussions. I mean, their, their districts and their communities are just as important to mine, even though we may disagree, disagree on policy. And, and certainly, you know, there's times when partisan politics becomes louder than maybe it should in that building. Um, I've had a lot of conversations, really, with Scott, with anybody who's been willing to come into my office and have a discussion to help us produce the best product possible. And so that has been maybe my Republican colleagues who've disagreed on some certain policies or they wanted to articulate certain priorities that were more important 
um, versus other other priorities that were maybe important to other members of the Republican caucus, and then certainly my Democrat colleagues as well. And in fact, you know, on Thursday when House Bill 2775, um, we had bipartisan support. So I think that just shows we worked really hard, you know, to ensure that we did the best for all kids across the state. And I think that was reflected in the end in, in the vote. The vote was, I believe, 45 to 2 on House Bill 2775, which I really think is a, just, is a demonstration that uh, we worked really hard to make sure, not that we were accommodating one senator or another, but that we were really trying to serve those kids in the best manner possible. And, and I'm very proud of the fact that our vote total and, and the vote on House Bill 2775, I think, reflected that. Final question, you've authored some other bills, uh, paid maternity leave, school choice, local control, things like that. What are some of the other bills besides the education reform package that you're most interested in trying to get across the line and what your constituents are saying about those particular measures you've authored? You know, it wasn't even just my constituents. I've I've said this many times, but I'm very proud of the work that all of us um, in the Senate have done really since the end of last session, Scott, when I started meeting and with superintendents and reaching out to school leaders and also reaching out to my colleagues and asking them to identify maybe individuals who were in their district that would be willing to come and contribute to really robust conversations about schools and how the legislature could be a partner with those schools, how we could serve those kids and those parents in those school districts. You know, there's a lot of superintendents and school leaders across the state. I don't know, and I haven't had the pleasure to meet yet. So I utilized, you know, not only my own network and my own contacts inside public schools around the state, but also my colleagues and met all interim and then continued that through the fall and even now through session. I, I like to joke that when my colleagues hear from their superintendents and their parents and the people that care about education in their district, I hear from all of them. So um, I've worked on a number of bills because of that process. I, I felt very confident that I was being mindful of a lot of considerations, you know, that districts are unique and they face different challenges based on where they are in the state or the students that they're serving or, you know, the local economies and the workforce challenges. So. I've laid out you know, a number of other bills in addition to the two that we've spoken about, as you mentioned. So things like paid maternity leave, that's now something I've been working on for three years. And we're, we're so close, you know, to to getting that over the finish line and and using it as a way to, you know, attract and retain, you know, great teachers who are whether they be in the classroom and they're getting ready to start families or they're considering, you know, joining this wonderful profession and and they start thinking about, well, I don't want to have to choose between my career at some point and raising a family. And so we wanted to honor and respect motherhood and respect the fact that you need time to be with your newborn. And I didn't want you to feel rushed to have to come back into the classroom and really be distracted where that's a disservice to the teacher. It's a disservice to the, the family, you know, and it's a disservice to the kids who are in the classroom and, and you know, need that teacher to, to be there with them. So I wanted to just honor, honor that time and really um, encourage, you know, encourage teachers to, to stay in the classroom, but take the time to bond with their, their baby and be mentally and emotionally and physically prepared to come back into the classroom. And in addition to that, we've, we've worked on school safety. You know, my colleague, Senator Pemberton, worked throughout the summer and I was on his working group as we talked through school safety issues. We worked on mentorship, Um, I I believe wholeheartedly in professional development of teachers and that teachers, especially uh, new teachers, not just knew the classroom, but knew that a district perhaps where a district is unique and does maybe some things differently than their previous district did, that they need mentors and they need professional development. And we want to reward the men and women that are going to spend extra time and invest in those new teachers. Also paying for credentials. You know, oftentimes teachers are asked uh, to do extra and to go above and beyond, maybe to take on a new class or they get hired to teach biology and now they don't need to teach chemistry or or move around um, based on a school's needs. And so we wanted to provide the right resources when teachers are getting extra credentials and, and learning new skills that the, the state through the school district would reimburse them for that. 
as, as a way to really incentivize and thank them for going above and beyond and, and building out their skill set as they matriculate through their careers. And we also have you know, a rewarding student outcomes bill, which is a, um, that's an area of reforming the A through F that you know, I've talked about with a number of colleagues for several years. Um, boy, there's, I think there's 44 bills in total that the Senate has worked on throughout throughout this half of session and sent over to the House. And, and um, you know, I'm excited for the support they've gained so far and certainly hopeful that they'll all be given, you know, proper consideration and, and the areas where there's agreement and the areas where there's excitement to do, can continue really the momentum and do these big things in education that as session, as session continues, we'll be able to continue to work on these products and make them better and uh, get them signed into law to, to really show teachers that, you know, we value your work and we're serious about, you know, investing in all of you. And, and we recognize that parents and, you know, students need, you know, need qualified men and women in the classroom and need our best and brightest to, you know, consider this profession and then also um, to develop them throughout their careers like any professional career. Um, would expect. So there's a lot of bills I'm excited about. Some of them have my name on them. Um, some of them have, uh, you know, my other my other Senate Senate colleagues' names on them. Uh, obviously, they all have House sponsors as well. So um, I'm just very thankful for the support they've received and for the feedback I've gotten, and and glad to have seen them make it this far. And looking forward to them becoming law as well. Senator Adam Pugh from Edmond, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today on Hot Seat. Scott, thanks very much. And uh, always a pleasure to be on your show, talking education, and uh, hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Take care, Scott. You as well. Thanks thank for joining you. us. Thanks for watching Hot Seat. See this again and my extended conversation with Senator Pugh at news9.com slash your vote counts and follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of those are at Mitchell Talks.